Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever edition of Merrimack College Television. I'm Nicole Fasciano. And I'm Colleen Miron. We are so excited to finally share the first MCTV show with you. Later we'll hear from Nico Urbino about what's been going on around campus and Mike Legage will give us the latest sports updates. Before we get started with that, I was lucky enough to sit down with the athletic director Jeremy Gibson and hear more about the D1 transition and what it means for Merrimack College as a whole. Let's take a look. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Fasciano and currently I am here with the Athletic Director here at Merrimack College, Jeremy Gibson. How are you doing today, Doing great, Jeremy? thanks for having me. Awesome. So we're just going to kind of ask a couple of questions about how the D1 transition has been going. Um, so my first question is, what are some of the regulation and compliance changes um, that have been going on since transitioning to going yeah, to D1? Yeah, so you know that's one of the, the most challenging aspects of this transition. Fortunately, we've had Division I men's and women's ice hockey programs mm -hmm. for a number of years. So we've operated by two sets of rule books and they are big, thick things and if you ever have insomnia, it's a, it's a fun thing to, yeah. to read to, to put you to sleep. But now we get to operate by one set of rules. And mm -hmm. so really all the rules that we've been applying for years to the hockey programs now apply to all of our other groups. And, and there are a lot of different things that range from the, the size of the rosters to playable seasons and all sorts of things, eligibility. Um, and it's, in some ways it's more challenging, but in some ways there's a little bit of a burden that's been relieved because now instead of having two different departments essentially that mm -hmm. we're running where we tried to be cohesive with it, they're all operating by the same rules. So it's, it's kind of nice to be in that situation. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And um, what will, like, do you think Merrimack's going to be adding any teams moving forward um, due to the D1 changes? Yeah, you know, and I don't know if it's as much about the D1 changes as it is about kind of the, the amazing growth that we've seen on this campus over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I came to Merrimack in 2013 and, you know, over a period of time we've added sports, primarily women's sports. We've added the women's swim team, we've added mm -hmm. uh, track and field teams, we've added uh, the golf team, the women's hockey team in 2013 being the most recent one, um, but we've really created over that period of time about 120 to 140 opportunities in the varsity programs for women, mm -hmm. um, and it's been part of the overall growth strategies for the, the college as well. As we go forward, we're going to look at our conference and the sports that they sponsor as championship sports, and while we, we fit their profile very closely and offer a lot of the same sports already, there are some that we don't have right now. So, so women's bowling is a mm -hmm. championship sport in the Northeast Conference, and we don't have it. Yeah. At some point, we probably will, but then I, we look at the opportunities that we might have to um, meet kind of the interest and ability of our students or prospective students, and so thinking about things like adding ski teams potentially. We've got a partnership that's being developed with an organization called Squash Busters, and so there's a likelihood of having squash on campus mm -hmm. at some point, and if we have the facilities, then certainly we'd be looking at adding the teams as well. So I think there will be some growth, but I think it's just more tied to the overall strategy of our, our profile more than the Division I piece. No, oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And how many students currently here are athletes, and do you see that number increasing now that we're going deep? Yeah, so we've, we've been steadily increasing for a number of years as well. Again, going back about six or seven years, our, our student athlete profile, we had about 400 to 420 student, varsity student athletes. Um, we've now got about 680 on campus already, and that's up from last year by about 50 student athletes. Um, we'll continue to see some roster growth in mm -hmm. some sports as we continue to add some of those other sports. We'll, we'll look at growing a little bit more. We've also seen growth in our club sport programs, and you know we've got over 400 students on campus now participating in club sports. So it's great that it's part of the culture on this campus. It's a really vibrant athletic culture, and, and it's fun to be a part of that. Yeah. And how um, does this recruitment like change? Like, how do you see it, you know, growing, expanding of where you guys will be recruiting from? Yeah. So, you know, I think more and more of the sports are going to look more like the profile of the hockey recruits mm. I've looked in the past. Not necessarily quite as international as those sports have been. Mm -hmm. Hockey. We've always had a lot of players from Canada on both the men's and women's side, from some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, soccer has always been a, an international sport with a lot of South Americans and Europeans on the team. 
but most of our other sports were, were very regional and our strategy for recruiting was to really win the best Division II talent in our area. Um, and we had a lot of success doing that. Mm -hmm. We're still going to try to be winning our backyard from a recruiting standpoint, but from a geographical point of view, we're going to be a lot broader. So looking at, at sports being down more in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, it's part of why this conference is such a good fit for us because so many of the other schools are spread out down into Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, but we're seeing more and more coaches going down to Florida, going to Texas and California and really all over the country and identifying the best talent that's out there. And it's, it's a really competitive process to try to A, identify the best student athletes and, and B, there, there are so many other schools competing for them as well. But we've been thrilled by how well Merrimack's been received by these kids mm -hmm. um, and we've got a lot of them already committed to coming in. Awesome. Yeah. And so what are the, some of the challenges and opportunities that you guys have faced so far with going D1? Yeah, so the biggest challenge, frankly, was the, the timeline of putting our schedules together. <laughs> yeah. So so we're just a little over a year past the, the time where we got the invitation to join the conference. We held a, a great uh, celebration on campus to celebrate that. And, you know, we've been really with our, our foot on the gas pedal trying to make sure that we had all the schedules in place. Um, so a, a schedule for, for one of our varsity sports, there are really two pieces of it. They play their conference schedule, which is all the other teams that are, are in our conference, and then there's a non-conference portion, which depending on the sport might make up about a third of the games that they play. Um, so we have the conference schedule for almost all of our sports, mm -hmm. uh, but we've had to go out and find these other non-conference games, and some of the sports schedule their games years in advance. Um, so we've been having to leverage relationships that we have with colleagues around the country, whether it's our coaches working with their colleagues or myself and other people in the administration. Um, just trying to find the matches and and we're thrilled with what we've been able to do in terms of the opponents um, you know we have uh, football going down this weekend to play at Lehigh they're wow. one of the the really historic programs in in college football you know they've been around for yeah. uh, I don't I'll make up a number but 100 years of football down there and here we are just our fifth game into being a division one program and we're competing against them future years we have games that are scheduled for four years in a row against schools like Holy Cross we're going to be playing at Harvard um, UNH next year so it's really the the profile of the schools but that's been a challenge it's been a lot of work mm -hmm. to get to that point but I'm proud of all the efforts that have gone into it no that's so awesome it sounds so exciting yeah. like I'm like getting excited yeah, for you guys um, and how are students being kind of helped throughout all this like process I yeah. mean I know with traveling schoolwork it must be hard so how yeah. are students being supported you know I, I think one of the great things about Merrimack is there's always been this tremendous network of support around mm -hmm. not just student athletes but all students um, you know, the, the things that we're doing for the student athletes going forward with, with the Division I piece is a little more focus around the academic side of things, although the, the academic standards at the Division I level to be eligible are actually higher than mm -hmm. they were at the Division II level. Um, so we've always done a really good job of bringing in talented students to be our student athletes. Um, but there's a real time commitment. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it's about having, um, it's not so much about the tutoring side of it, it's about the structure and making sure that from a time management standpoint, when you have a student that's spending as much time in the classroom as they are, as much time as they need to focusing on their sport, making sure that they've got the tools to be successful. And whether it's, it's uh, Dean Ellard in the Student Success Center, mm -hmm. or you know, all the different deans in, in the academic areas, they do a fantastic job of working with student athletes. I'm so excited to see where the D1 transition brings Merrimack. Up next, we'll hear from Nico Urbino about the Triple E Scare and all things school news. Nico? Thank you, Colleen and Nicole. Various communities in the Merrimack Valley and throughout Massachusetts still remains at high risk for Triple E through a first year of the frost, or should I say the first frost of the year. Triple E is an extremely rare but serious and often fatal infection that causes inflammation in, of the brain. There have been four fatalities and 11 total cases of Triple E in Massachusetts in 2019. The college performed a campus-wide spraying to reduce the mosquito population on August 29th. Officials at Merrimack College also recommend that students stay indoors after dusk, use the insect repellent, and a bid by any new precautions put in place by campus administrations. To get more information 
and updates regarding the triple E virus, please visit the Town of the North Andover website at northandoverma.gov for information, additional information, actually. The S Student Government Association is a prominent organization here at Merrimack that works to make the voices of students heard. SGA is made up of students from each class here who have all been elected by their peers. And the organization's main goal is to make changes around campus that the student body would like to see. SGA President Amanda Gallagher explained that SGA this year hopes to improve their communication with students and hoping to have a constant and effective relationship with the rest of the student body. SGA meets weekly on Tuesdays at 4.30 p.m. and students are encouraged to attend meetings and voice their opinions. Freshmen, listen up. Ali Collins took the streets to ask students around campus what advice they would give to their first years. I'm with MCTV News and I'm here with Sammy. Can you give us some advice on um, what you think of your freshman year or something that you wish you did your freshman year? Um, well, I would say that it's really tough to find friends sometimes, but you just have to hold out and hope that the true ones come to you eventually. I would say get to know your professors really well. One piece of advice. Work hard. Um, find people in your major, live with them, they could help. Um, yeah, study. <laughs> Definitely get involved in your community, like personally, like where you're living. I'd say like, for example, a lot of people open their doors to just like get to know like their floor and stuff like that. You should also get more involved on campus in like clubs and such, just so you can get used to like the Merrimack community because as a small school, it kind of scales with high school and as you get the most experience out of it if you just like kind of work with the people around you, like whether it's a sport or like something personal. So, yeah. Oh, I want to tell the freshmen to take advantage of your professor's office hours. They're really helpful and they're there for you. I think you should always try to focus on the positive side of everything. <laughs> uh, I would say definitely get involved. I think it'll change your entire experience. Um, it really impacted my life, so definitely get involved in even just one or two things. Um, I would say start early on going to class every day. Um, I know it's tempting to skip because you don't have somebody like looking over you and stuff and telling you to go to class, but definitely don't start the habit of skipping class and stuff and just keep up with your homework. The advice I would give is get involved as much as you can, activities, socialize, that's how you make friends, maybe reduce some of the, the homesickness if you have it, you know, in the first few weeks of school and, um, you know, kind of just get around and, you know, make friends. Get to know Debbie. There you have it, freshmen. It is important to get involved as soon as possible. That is it. For uh, school news, back to you in the studio. Thanks, Nico. I feel so much better knowing that our campus has been sprayed to help reduce the mosquito populations. I also have a much better understanding of how SGA works and what they do for our campus. Me too, Nicole. And I definitely agree with all the advice given to freshmen. Next, we'll hear from Mike Legage with Merrimack Varsity Sports Updates, as well as a club sport highlight. Welcome to MCTV Sports. My name is Michael Gage, and I have a lot prepared to discuss with you guys today. To begin, the Merrimack College football team welcomed fellow NEC opponent Brian Bulldogs into Dwayne Stadium for the first home game against an NEC opponent. A record 10,172 people were in attendance. The Warriors played the Bulldogs tough, but ultimately fell 24-17. For every MCTV edition, we will put a spotlight on one club sport here at Merrimack. For this show, let's take a look at the women's rugby team. The women's rugby team is one of 18 club sport teams here at Merrimack. The team has been around since 2011 and is a part of the Rugby Northeast Conference. Senior captains Kyla Keefe and Claire Markey lead the team with guidance from head coach Christian Lavalli. Junior VP of the team, Ryan Cron, explained that she is very excited to see how her team is going to grow this year. The team has been coming together as a unit and saw their first win in three years this season. They are currently 1-4 but have high expectations for the rest of their fall season and are feeling confident for the upcoming spring season. 
If you are interested in joining the team, please email clubwomensrugby at merrimack.edu or reach out to any of the captains. Come support the rugby team October 28th at their next home game here at Dwayne Stadium. In other news this month has been a busy one for the Warriors. Men's hockey played host to number 15 ranked Wisconsin over the long weekend. Even with multitudes of students headed home for the long weekend, over 2,100 fans packed Lawler Rink for this year's home hockey opener. The Warriors tallied five goals but in the end fell short of the Badgers losing 11-5. They moved to 0-3 for the year. Women's hockey played number 10 ranked Boston University away from home in Boston. They came away with a 2-2 tie, moving to a 2-2-1 record on the season. Men's soccer improves to 6-3-2 and 4-0 in NEC conference play with a 1-0 win against St. Francis Brooklyn. Women's soccer also beat St. Francis Brooklyn 1-0 and then went on to lose 4-0 against Long Island University. Field hockey lost 4-0 at Sacred Heart. That's it for MCTV Sports. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Mike. Good luck to all of our student-athletes as they continue on with their seasons. Before we go, let's take a look at the September police log printed in the first Beacon edition of the year. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? On September 4th, a student came in to report his Yeti cup was stolen. His information was taken and he was advised an officer would be doing a report and checking cameras. On September 5th, a resident student reported her roommate told her there are spider eggs in her bed. Officers responded and spoke with the female student. AC on duty was contacted. Female student refused emergency placement for the night. Later that day, an officer responded to the food truck outside Crow Hall to speak with an employee and a student who are having a disagreement. On September 7th, MCPD responded to a residential hall for reports of an unresponsive male lying in the middle of the hallway. The individual was arrested and transported to the hospital. The following night, an RA called MCPD to report a fight on the main stairwell of O'Brien. Units advised and responded, an officer reports they are looking for a male subject that ran out of the building with a ripped shirt. Officers report that individuals involved are two resident students and one non-resident student. The same night, a 61-year-old resident at Royal Crest called. The man wanted to know who he could speak to regarding the students that live above him. AC on duty was contacted. On September 10th, an officer spoke with residents in Monacan Hall about turning down his television and keeping his voice down every night. Also on September 10th, the mother of a commuter student called to see if MCPD could help her locate her son, whom she can't get in contact with. Officers located her son who was in class and he will be going to speak with his mother who was parked on campus. On September 13th, a student came in to report her Donald Trump magnet had been stolen from her car. She will be filling out a statement form and an officer will be taking a report. Caller from Royal Crest advised MCPD kids in the apartment below them are being loud. MCPD did a walkthrough of the building and did not hear anything. And that's a wrap. Thank you everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed the first edition of MCTV. Stay tuned for the November edition. I'm Colleen Miron. And I'm Nicole Fasciano. We'll see you next time.